But you can still ask stupid questions. That's not uh, that's not forbidden. Uh, so the very general plan is today. I make some propaganda uh, of why this can be important. Why people are interested in it, and uh, I do some very basic stuff from geometry. Maybe on an example. <clears throat> Tomorrow, I more or less from scratch would say something about numerical methods and mostly classical numerical methods, maybe with a little bit touch of geometry. And the third lecture that will be on Friday, uh, I will try to piece these things together. So I will uh, explain how the geometry can be used to design numerical methods and uh, why this may be useful for modeling in mechanics, okay? And uh, I actually asked to put my third lecture a little bit later in the week because I will be given some exercises. So maybe if you want to really understand what's going on, it's a good idea to uh, at least try. And I mean, we are not uh, passing an exam or anything, but we will uh, correct all the important things, but it's good to try to solve some of the exercises I will be giving. Uh, now, when I talk to colleagues about these subjects, I usually show this kind of uh, picture, <clears throat> which is supposed to, uh, which is supposed to represent somehow the general philosophy of this uh, structure preserving numerical methods or geometric integrators or geometric numerical methods, you will hear this a lot from me. So the idea is roughly speaking that you want to you want to do some simulations of complicated mechanical systems. So this is on the left of your table. And <clears throat> uh, if you do it naively, then most probably you will recover some non-physical behavior of the system. And now suppose that you know that your system has some physical, some qualitative physical properties. And this is like the first table here, right? And the most typical one would be energy, conservation of energy. But there are also many, many more, like you want to keep track of symmetries of the system, you want to keep track of some power balance, which is due to dissipation, or you want to make two simple systems to interact and to form a complicated system, all this kind of business. And you see there are two parts of the table. The first one, which I call the classical, classical mechanics. First classical is because it's not quantum. And the second classical, because it's like old mechanics. So something that has been present here for maybe 200 years, you heard something from Aiden, for example, and he was citing the reference of 1870. Uh, and uh, the second part of the table, which I call modern classical mechanics, is mostly about partial differential equations, so mechanics of continuous media. Uh, I will pronounce a lot of words, and as mentioned, that will be from three different communities, potentially. I assume that you're more or less geometers, but if it's not the case, please protest. And if I'm pronouncing some word that you like don't understand, that you don't know, also please protest as well. Okay. Uh, now, this this uh, physical properties somehow can be reflect, reflected in geometric structures, and we, at least in these three lectures, we will probably only discuss this first line. Uh, which is how you treat conservative systems in the framework of symplectic or Poisson geometry. Um, but all the others are also important and all the others are sometimes even more complicated. Like for instance, you want to study symmetries. Obviously there is some group in the game, like you heard the lectures of Alexei. And if, uh, if it's a continuous symmetry, then probably it's a Lie group. And there is a way to treat it uh, to treat it uh, in a very geometric way, and also a lot of other systems. Like I, I personally do Dirac geometry. I'm probably not going to talk about this, or maybe in the very end of the third lecture. 
let's see how it goes. Um, now, you see that on the right, you have a list of geometric structures. And some of them are highlighted in green. This means that there is a numerical method, or at least some way to design a numerical method that will preserve these geometric structures, okay? What does it mean? It means that you will solve your system, you will keep track of this geometric structure. And since the philosophy says that this geometric structure encodes the, the physics of the system, it means that you will at least better preserve that physics of the system. So two, two messages from this table. There is one, one step which is kind of modeling, right, from here. And you want this model to keep some uh, qualitative properties of your system that you know. And there is another step, which may be vaguely called as geometrizing mechanics. So G M, um, which is already important by itself. Like uh, since ages, people were trying to establish some formalisms, how to describe physical and mechanical systems. And this geometrizing mechanics also helps to, uh, to design some numerics. So numerics enters the game here. And we will try to follow this path, uh, at least for the first line for energy and uh, symplectic geometry. And at the end of the day, we will, okay, it's a very classical now well-established story. We will uh, see what symplectic integrator, so symplectic structure preserving numerical methods uh, do in this context and why they are in a sense nicer than the naive numerical methods. Is this message fine? Is this uh, kind of uh, motivation or propaganda uh, okay, uh, and it's also kind of from experience, it seems that if you are a geometer, it's much easier to understand uh, all the other parts of the puzzle than if you are, for instance, doing some engineering or some numerics itself. So it's easier to teach a geometer numeric and numerical methods than the other way around. Okay, maybe I'm wrong for some people, but statistically, this is what happens. And I'm for maybe three or four years, I'm now to, talking to people from mechanics, and it took me maybe one year just to start speaking the correct language with them. So if something sounds complicated to you, this is totally fine. And as mentioned again, you can ask questions. Uh, now, I said that we will do some simple things, but actually I will show a couple of examples of uh, pretty fancy things. So you are supposed now to see the video, this thing that never works, obviously. Okay, let's give it a try. I don't know how good you see this, but there is a wave front. Uh, let me launch it again. So maybe maybe not, now, you can, now, now you saw it. And what I'm trying to say is that this is actually very difficult to simulate. So the picture was taken in some aquarium where you can actually go beneath the wave. So you can look at the wave, how it rolls over. And now imagine you are trying to simulate this wave front. You will obviously solve some equation for the for its profile, and it starts in some kind of smooth way, right? And then it goes on, and at some point it starts being vertical, right? And then what you see in the video, or maybe not that well, uh, it starts rolling over, right? What's the issue? The issue is that here, it's a nice function, right? You can say it's u of x. Here, okay, it's still a function, but you have some, some trouble here. And 
here it's not even a function, right? I, I cannot I cannot say that the profile is the profile is described by the function u of x. You have multiple values of it, right? Uh, and uh, I think Avent at some point mentioned some stories of jets, and this is one of the fancy geometry that helps to understand what's going on. Because if you go into the jet space, then you don't look at the function of x that is propagating, but you look at some surface in a bigger space that starts folding. So well, you have- What is a jet space? Yeah, that's a fair question. And uh, in the like really waving hands, you would say that now I declare my all my variables, my emission variables, new variables, and I declare all their derivatives, the new variables. So instead of writing this equation, ut, plus u, ux, et cetera. I will say that this is a new variable, like whatever, v plus u plus- I, I see, I see, thank you. Yeah, so I, I enlarge my space. And now this equation is something that he was talking about. It will be just a sub manifold in that space. Uh, and what I draw here would be just cuts of the surface uh by the constant time plane okay and there the dynamics is nice so if you're able to do computations in that space then you don't have you don't have this issue and actually if you do uh, computer modeling you would probably think i mean there is word symmetry in the on the slide you would probably think of take, taking account this symmetry into a computation. And then that wouldn't resolve uh, that wouldn't resolve this issue, but it will still help you with identifying this one. So what do I mean is that uh, when you have this almost vertical profile, that's kind of bad for numerics, trust me. So it will create some oscillations that you don't want to see. Uh, but if you design a numerical method, that respects the symmetry of your initial equations, then at least at this point you will see, ah yes, it's vertical, but I didn't, but I didn't recover this unphysical behavior yet. And then I spotted the problem and I said, okay, now I need to do something else. Now I need to switch to a fencer space. Okay. And then maybe just another picture because all these pictures are taken here in La Rochelle. So you see the bridge behind my back. If you cross that bridge, you would get to this place, which is called Ile de Ré or the Ré Island. Uh, and the picture is actually very interesting phenomena. You see, you have two propagating wave fronts, like this direction, right? And this direction. And on the one hand, it's described by a very simple, uh, okay, very simple, by some uh, differential equations that is kind of nice because it uh, is integrable, whatever it means for the moment. Uh, on the other hand, that's a very complicated nonlinear phenomena. If you want to, if you see this on, on, on the coast, you probably don't want to swim inside. Because what it means is that there is probably one current that is going this direction, uh, some tide or some waves, and there is one very strong current going this direction. So, okay, now my picture is messy. Let me put it in red. There is some current going that direction that will probably just tow you away from the coast. Uh, and again, a little bit waving hands, you want to do modeling of the system, you want to do computer simulations. On the one hand, you want to capture this nonlinear phenomena, like this very extreme cases. On the other hand, you want to keep track of some qualitative properties of the system. And the word integrability here stands for a lot of conserved properties, a lot of conserved quantities in the system. So you might want to do this 
two things simultaneously. And again, by hand, it's very difficult, but geometry can, can help you out. Okay, I'm done with the propaganda. I will turn to science, but if up to now you have some questions, maybe it's also a good time to ask for some remarks. Okay, um, if no questions so far, let me give you now a simple example. I mean, simple, something that as a matter of anecdote, I was at some point teaching in high school. So if you're you are a first year student, you should not be scared. Uh, if you are uh, finishing a PhD, that's still interesting. There are still things to explore. I will say some words about molecular dynamics. So I, I draw you a molecule here and maybe I need to label the, the atoms. So let this to be uh, carbon and this white ones would be hydrogen. And this one is obviously oxygen. And my question to you is, what do I need to know to study the dynamics of this molecule? So I draw you this, maybe in three-dimensional space. And I want to know how it moves. What do I need to know? What, I, what do I need to tell me? I have time, I have coffee. I, I want some guess from you. Momentum, okay, there is a word momentum. Yeah, and maybe let me, momentum of velocity actually, right? So I need to, I know the positions of all the particles and I need to give all the velocities, okay. Let's say this is given, then what's next? What do I do? <clears throat> is it enough? So I know the initial position of my molecule and I know the initial velocities of it. Or it's not the same that you think for momentum, Yagma. Cool, thanks. So, is it enough? So I, I give you all this data, I go drink my coffee and in three minutes you tell me what is the trajectory of the molecule. Probably not, right? I need, I need to do something else. Yes, forces, good. Okay, so I need some some forces and I'm not drawing it because the picture would be messy. So I will give you Fi for all, all uh, for, for, for the okay, acting, acting on the height particle. Uh, okay, and what do I do with that? What did you do in high school with that when you were 12? So you, you know the particles, you know the, the positions, velocity, you're right. You write something like that. Right, that's the Newton's second law. And now you realize that you were doing differential equations, right? Because that was precisely the second derivative equals to, okay, Fi, Fi over M, right? And this, this is a second order differential equation. And then, okay, if you're lucky enough, you can solve it. If not, then not. Uh, maybe to be honest, I need to describe some of the forces. And the usual story about molecular dynamics, you would give, a, I would give you a bunch of potentials that describe these forces. So well, I will actually say that my differential equation has this form. 
they are all, all where all the forces forces are potential. So you have some huge function, which I will call potential energy, that depends on the positions of all the particles, and it has some complicated uh, complicated uh, form depending on what you want to to simulate, depending on the model of your molecule. Uh, let me, for the moment, disregard this external forces. So I, I'm not using it in this in this talk. But maybe maybe I can still do it. Whatever. Uh, uh, if you are not comfort, com comfortable with this sign d, this this partial d, u over d, r i, just to be on the safe side. So r is a vector. It has three components. R y, R z, and uh, this the position the, the system depends on the positions of all the particles, uh, and when when we write this d u over d r i, it means that we will fix all the others and differentiate only by the ith uh, ith r radius vector. Okay, if you are a first year student and it's your first time to see partial derivatives, this is that. So you have a lot of variables and you will differentiate to, by only some of them. Um, now, I don't know if I need to go deep into details of this model, but just to say that uh, there is a way to cut the molecule into pieces and to say what pieces are interacting. And for instance, uh, this first potential would be responsible for what is called Valence bounds, so the uh, the uh, atoms that are chemically uh, linked, this thing would be responsible for valence angles. So if you have three atoms, they form some angle, and there is some potential attached to it. Then this is what is called the torsion angle. Angle, so the molecule could rotate around some axis, and again. Uh, what is the this is alpha? So th 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 then there is some interaction, and obviously the positions are not the same. And then there are electric charges and some other weaker interactions that are uh, for non chemically bonded atoms. Uh, not very important uh, what it means for the moment, but let's say you have some explicit formulas. I have all the coefficients and I have all the parameters. Now I have all the velocities, coordinates, and whatever else you want me to ask. Do you want me to ask anything? Uh, okay. Now, now, actually, yeah, now you can solve this system. So you have a differential equations. You, from the previous slide, you have the uh, initial positions, you have the velocities, and all this thing together you can solve. Uh, I will not ask you to solve that, the package would do it for you. But I will ask another question. So can you prove or at least what is proof, I don't know, that the energy of the system is conserved during its motion. So I have this complicated system and I want to say something about its total energy, okay? And you want to prove or at least study if it is conserved. So what would you do? Yes, that's a correct answer. So the idea is you want to see something uh, is conserved, you will 
say, okay, total energy, you will spell it out. Uh, there will be some part which is related to the kinetic energy, right? There will be some part, this huge part, that we agreed depends on all the positions of the particles, right? And what you will do, you want to compute the time derivative. Okay, maybe let me spell it out. So this is d over dt of this total energy, all right? And then how would you do this? Okay, you have 25 minutes left, <laughs> go on. Yeah, well, I, I see some people are smiling because you realize this is something that you can do, but you don't want to, right? Because what, what would happen already the first term, you would encounter the first derivative of your velocity, which is acceleration. And the acceleration is given by this formula. Right, so actually all this, all these uh, equations that I, I wrote on the slide, you will have to eventually plug into this thing. And then you would do the same, but for velocities and for the potential, right? You don't really want to do it, but we will still do something of the sort. So let me, I mean, in the real world, we would go to a blackboard and do some computations. So let me go to the blackboard. Um, th th this is my setting. This is my setting. The total energy is again, some uh, mi pi squared over two plus u of all the r, all the r's. And uh, let me play some game of notations. So the first thing I will denote, since it was already mentioned, I will say, I will define momenta. Momenta, well, in some cultures they call it impulses, they will be the mass of the particle, times its velocity, okay? This you have done in high school. You can either describe the system in terms of coordinates and velocities or coordinates and momenta, right? And in simple cases like this, they're just related by a prefactor of mass. And just, you know, to keep my notations consistent, I will denote, and this does not for the moment mean much, but just, you know, not to, not to mix with the previous ones. I will say that instead of using R's, I will use Q's, okay? And you will recognize some geometry very soon. So then my total energy will be easily rewritten. And I denote it now by some letter that you have already seen. That will be sum over I P I squared over two N I uh, plus U now of Q I Q one Q N. And uh, okay, let's pretend that they are now scalar variables. So I will denote it by some other N here. Okay. So if you want, I what I did, I I listed all the variables like R one, R two. Wait, sorry. R one X, R one Y, R one Z, R two X, R two y r2 z okay etc and the last one is r n 
Z. And I called all this Q1 up to Qn, okay? And I did the same with the Ps. Like I replaced all the Vs times the respective mass by Pi. So this guy is now, now depends on big N variables and my big N is three times small N. And now I forget all what was before. So this is my system. Uh, I still need to say something about dynamics, right? Uh, what can I say about the time derivative of Q? Before it was the velocity, right? Now I don't have the velocity, but I have the velocity times the mass. I can still use it, right? So that will be PI over MI, right? And how do I rewrite the equation for PI? So this dot is always the time derivative. What would it be? Before I had du by dr i, right? And we agreed that we no longer use this, but we can actually notice that the derivative of u with respect to any coordinate is the same as the derivative of the total energy with respect to all the coordinates, right? So I can safely write that this is just dh over dq i with the minus sign, okay? And also a simple computation, right? This is derivatives of the polynomial. This is just dh over dp i, okay? <clears throat> uh, Okay, there is a question in the chat saying that, uh, that the, yeah, okay. That's a tricky question. Yes and no, right? Depends on how you define mechanics. So the question is, does not second Newton's law come from the conservation of energy? The short answer is no. The long answer is, uh, kind of yes, but not that energy that we are talking about. So you would define what is called the Lagrangian of the system. And then you would say that there is some variation, not necessarily with respect to time, that there is some variation that vanishes. And this will produce something that you would call Euler Lagrange equations. And that in our simple case would be just rewritten as what we have seen. Okay, does it answer the question? If not, I'm willing to talk about it, but maybe later. And this is actually a tricky part of what people would call geometrizing mechanics. So now, is, is everyone happy with with this uh, with this set of equations? If not, please protest. So in the, 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 the upshot, what we have done, we have taken this huge uh, molecular dynamic system with a fancy potential, and just by some game of notations, uh, said that actually the whole dynamics is now governed by this uh, function h. And obviously I didn't call it h for, uh, for, for out of uh, random choice. This is h for Hamiltonian. Uh, you have those who were here, you have seen this word in one of the talks of the students. And actually this is the, okay, to be honest, it's an example, but this is a pretty general example of what people call Hamiltonian systems. So you are, uh, 
you have two types of coordinates in the system, Q and P, but for time derivatives of both of them, you only need to know the function H, okay? Now, uh, we can forget about this part, more or less, and let's try to compute the time derivative of H, actually what we wanted to do in the first place. But now we have a, a probably a more convenient formula for it. So how would this work? H depends on Q and P. So when I differentiate it over time, uh, I will have dH over dQ, Q dot plus dH over dP, P dot, right? Yes, no. Okay, you, you should have said uh, what? <laughs> that long formula turns into this small one. Actually, the honest thing would be to say sum again over i, dqi, q dot i, and there again sum over i, dpi, di dot. Right, I always going from one to the dimension of, of to the number of coordinates. But now I know what is qi dot and what is pi dot. And I have this sum dh dqi. And I just replace the qi dot from here. That gives me dh over d p i. Now I have plus dh d p i p i dot, which I, which goes from here. Sorry, oops. Minus dh d q i. Right, and I can say that it's the sum of the whole thing. Again, I can going from one to n, and this is and this is right. And this is zero, right? Because this is exactly the same term as here, but with a minus sign. So they all cancel out. So what we have proven, instead of, instead of doing this fancy computation, by just a game of notations in half a page, and with this half a page, I was even kind of pedagogic, I hope, we have proven that the energy is preserved. Okay, and this is probably the first encounter of uh, what I would call the geometry to characterize the, the uh, physics of the system. Because actually what we have done here, we have considered So that was a very simple example of Poisson geometry. That was a simple example, example of Poisson geometry. And uh, if you know this, or if you remember from, from the talks for yesterday, what is the story about Poisson geometry? You have some manifold M, and in our case, it was what people call the cotangent bundle to the uh, configuration space of the mechanical system. 
the coordinates Q will live in here and the coordinates P will live in, in the on the fibers. Uh, and on this uh, on this manifold M, you were looking at the smooth functions. And on them, you define an operation which is called the Poisson bracket, which takes two smooth functions and gives you another one. And the, the way it does here, that, that will be just given by a formula. So I have two functions, all of them depend on Q and P. Uh, and their Poisson bracket would be just, okay, just would be sum over I, D, F over D, uh, Q, I, D, G, D, P, I, minus this same thing the other way around, D, F, D, I, D, G, D, Q, I. Okay, again, from one to N, the whole thing. And the magic of this formulation is that now you can uh, notice that X dot, oh, sorry, there is no X in the game, that Q dot, is precisely uh, the bracket of Q with H and P dot is precisely the bracket of P with H. Okay. And this is probably my first exercise. Exercise one is check this. And for instance, what you need to check, and I'm doing this on purpose, uh, like 50% ch chance I missed the sign. And actually, this is true for any, for any function. So if I want a function that depends on Q and P, and I want to compute its time derivative, this will be, well, again, with the same eventual sign, conventional mistake, that will be F for some bracket with H. And as a direct consequence, I compute H. And there, I don't care about the sign. Because if you look at this thing, it's anti-symmetric in F and G, right? This is equal to minus G F, G bracket F. So if, if I compute the bracket of some function with itself, it always vanishes. So this guarantees automatically that this is always zero, right? So I do invite you to check this at some point. I mean, it's a not a huge computation. It's just differentiating functions. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, this is also an example of something that I will tell you probably now tomorrow because I have like five minutes left. Uh, this is also, it's also an example and again, a very typical one of a symplectic space. Um, so how do I do this? Yeah, so this is next time, tomorrow. But this is an important remark. So the symplectic form, I think you remember it a little bit from Avent if you were uh, here last week, 
uh, he defined differential forms. So a symplectic form is a particular kind of differential forms, um, which are closed and non-degenerate. And actually, they can also be used to define dynamics. Uh, now, let me give you two more exercises. Uh, so what, we, we agreed on something here, right? If I give you a Poisson bracket and I give you a Hamiltonian, then you can write differential equations. And in some good cases, you can solve them. And also this Hamiltonian is, uh, has the physical meaning of energy. So I'll give you two examples. Exercise two. Uh, you take the same Poisson bracket and you take the Hamiltonian, which is very simple, which is just Q squared over two plus P squared over two. The question is write the equations and solve them. And this you actually remember from high school. This is just MS spring system, right? Some mass which is moving that way. And I put all the coefficients to one. Uh, this is the first thing. And the second thing, you have some Hamiltonian which looks very much alike in the momentum part, but in the uh, coordinate part, there is some nonlinearity and you probably uh, also know what this is. This is a simple pendulum. So this is now your Q. And the question is the same. Uh, write the equations and uh, try to solve them. Oops. And you will see that in the first case, you can actually solve them, so write the formula. But in the second case, the formula is tricky. But you can still say something about the system knowing that the energy is conserved. So you can more or less draw the trajectories. OK? Is it fine for the moment? Any questions, any remarks? Okay, the, the usual convention is uh, stance, right? You can write an email to me or you can uh, uh, try to contact me in the chat while I'm still here. Uh, I try to be reactive. Um, and tomorrow we continue a little bit in this very classical story. Uh, and then we will go to numerical methods. So this is basically one slide to say what we have done today. But tomorrow we will have more details, like more geometric details and more numerical details. Questions so far? Remarks so far? Okay, let, let me stop the recording and then maybe questions appear. <laughs>